Good morning, church. And that thought just <clears throat> popped in my mind right now. It's like, could you imagine if there was no Emmanuel? <laughs> could you imagine if there was no God with us? That's a hopeless state. That's a hopeless place to be in if God is not with you. But look at how much the Father loves us, that he gave us his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will never face eternal death you'll have eternal life forever and ever that's the he is the reason for the season this is the reason why we celebrate this is the reason why we we uh we do what we do but let's keep the main thing the main thing right it's not about being stressed out at the mall trying to buy gifts or online or trying to stressed out about you didn't get the bonus you thought you were going to get. Or even as Michelle said, sometimes, you know, the Christmas brings painful memories. This is not even about that. It's about what the Lord has done for us in light of everything going on. Um, so next Sunday morning will be Christmas Eve. And uh, my wife had prayed about it and we had talked about it and we decided it would be cool if we, uh, we, me and her, our family's going to show up a little bit earlier and we're going to kind of do like how, uh, the, the, you know, the little taco Sunday, how we had like a little table out there. And I mean, we're not gonna have nothing big, but you know, some refreshments, some hot cocoa, some, you know, maybe it's like the foyer moved out there, but we're going to be here a little bit early. I think we're trying to get here like around, uh, maybe nine or nine thirty. So if you feel led to, you're more than willing to come a little early and hang out. If not, you know, we're just trying to be a presence for the people out there. And maybe, um, I don't know, some people who don't have nowhere to go on Christmas Eve and we can be a blessing to them. So uh, that's what's going on next, uh, next, next week. Um, well, you can clap for him. Praise him. Praise God. <laughs> you know, when, uh, <clears throat> when you really look at life, when, when you look at what, what drives us as human beings, it, it, it kind of boils down to desires. It kind of really boils down to desires when you really kind of peel back the veil and take a look at what drives human beings to do what they do. I mean, just think of it. From birth, right? A, a, a baby leaves its mother uh, and, 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 and comes into earth and, uh, you know, from the onset, this, this, this infant's desire is for milk. It, its desire is, is food and its desire is touch. You know, as, as, a, as a newborn parent, you know, the whole skin to skin thing. They're like, you know, what I mean, keep your baby on you because, you know, he or she wants to be close to you. It desire, the, the child desires to be touched. And, and then and as this infant gets a little bit older into like a toddler or, or, or a young child, this, this boy or girl starts to desire other things like, like toys. Uh, oh, these things that I like. I want to play with this. And, and even friends. Oh, I desire companionship. Uh, I desire fellowship with other, other people, be it older people or much younger people their age. And then, and then this boy or this girl, they, they get older and they become ad- adolescents. And then, uh, you know, whether or not they receive it or not, they, they desire popularity. Do you all know what it was like to be in junior high? Whether you were trying to be or not, everybody wanted to be accepted. You, you, were, you were too young to be a child or too old to be a child, and you were too young to be an adult. You were in this weird stage. You know, body starts changing, things start smelling, hair starts growing places. You know, your feet all of a sudden from one summer sprout out to like a size. You know, your voice gets deeper. Young men start getting hair on their face, don't know what to do with it. And, and, and these adolescents, they desire popularity and acceptance. And then, and then uh, this young boy or this teenage, uh, you know, teenage boy or girl, they, they grow up and they become adults. And then, and then they desire prestige, want to be prestigious, whether it's going to school and, and getting a degree or, or high, climbing up the corporate ladder and, and becoming somebody with that, with that office in the corner and, 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 and you're, the, you're the boss or starting your own company, whatever it is, we, we desire prestige and, and success. All these desires bound up in the heart of a human being. But ultimately, church, this should be our number one desire in life. Psalm 27 verse 4 says, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see, it all, it, it, it's all wrapped up in Christ. Everything that we're looking for, everything that we thought would provide so much for us and, and, and fulfill us, we come to find out that those things don't really provide that lasting fulfillment that we're, we're looking for. It's, it's Christ. It's Christ. And we have to name him. It's Yeshua HaMashiach, if you translate it into Hebrew. But you have to name him. You can't just say God. Because there's all kind of little G's running around this world. People could say they believe in God. But do you believe in the one true God? The only true God, the true God of Israel, the true God who 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 doesn't have an ending or beginning, who lives outside of space and time, who was never born, (laughs) but has always been the great I am. That is who we should desire to be in fellowship with. That's who we should desire to be our portion all the days of our life. That's the one who we need to learn to be still before him and just sense his presence. And it's not necessarily an emotional thing, but it is something that we we train ourselves and we discipline ourselves to do because it is of such great importance. And on the back end, we get the benefit of having peace, joy, love, prosperity in every sense of the word. Definitely spiritually. Maybe he may monetarily bless you and you will prosper in that way. But either way, uh, his, his innermost desire is to fulfill you, who you are, your innermost being. Amen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Um, So this week, uh, we we will continue on in Ecclesiastes. Next week, we'll we'll have a Christmas uh, message. Um, So we're going to take a break from this book next week. But uh, right now, we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And Lord willing, we'll get through verses 5 through 12. I don't know. Y'all know how I preach. Don't know if we'll get there. But uh, we're slated to go through verses 5 through uh, 12 uh, once again, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Uh, this is a, I don't know how many part series this is, but uh, this is part two in the series that we started last week called The Difference Between Wisdom and Folly. So uh, if you can uh, get there, uh, please uh, stand for the reading of God's word. We'll go ahead and read our text. We'll pray, lift everything up to our God, and then get into the heart of this message. So starting in verse 5, it says, It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts their heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry for anger Lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, that is what we ask. We ask that you would preserve us. We ask that you would sanctify us. We ask that you would uh, continue to make us whole. Help us to continue to walk out this sanctification process. Help us to enjoy the journey. Lord, may we not grumble and complain. May we not murmur. May we learn from the children of Israel in the wilderness. May we be those that that take it to heart that you've given us this day. You saw fit that you wanted us alive and you woke us up. We didn't have to wake up. There's been people that have passed on this week. They're no longer here. Praise God that they, some of those people knew you. But Lord, may we make good use of the time that you've given us. Father, I pray that you would supernaturally speak through me, through your word. I pray that you would empty us all of ourselves, fill us fresh with the Holy Spirit, Give us a supernatural anointing and give us a a discernment to understand your word, to rightfully divide it, to see the importance of it, to apply it to our lives. I pray against every single distraction. Lord, I pray that you would just, just take it far from us. 
Whatever we came in here with, whatever baggage, whatever, whatever situations, whatever problems, Lord, there will be an opportunity and a time to lay those things at your feet. But may we come in this building with thanksgiving and praise on our lips and in our hearts. It's not just about what we receive from you. It's about what we come to bring. And I ain't talking about money. I'm talking about what is us. Who are we? What do we bring to you? What do we bring to your altar? Father, may you do a mighty work that only you can do. It is through the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So last week, we, we, we looked at how it is far better to, to earn a good name through living an obedient life in Jesus Christ than it is to have expensive material possessions. It's far better to, to earn a good name, to, to live a godly life, to live a life that, that's above reproach, to live a life that's set apart, that's holy, that's sanctified. That's far better than obtaining all kind of stuff in this life. Because all this stuff will never satisfy us. I mean, stuff in itself, it's an inanimate object. It's not bad or good. But the time that we spend on stuff, just, just weigh it out. How much time do you spend on trying to obtain stuff? And how much time do you spend on trying to further your relationship with Father God? Don't answer it out loud. Just take a survey in your mind and think about it. Because that will give you a, a timetable of what's really going on within your heart. And we say we love God, but we put him on the back burner. We're not loving him. We're not loving him the way he should be loved. We learn that mourning is better than laughter and that the day that we die is far better than the day we were born. Um, I mean, I got a firsthand uh, view of this this week. My, my, my cousin Gino that, that, I, that I saw when I went to Hawaii a couple months back and, you know, I told you guys he was dying uh, or he was dying of stage four cancer. Uh, well, he went home to be with the Lord uh, a few days ago. And uh, but it was an answer prayer, you know, because I had prayed, Lord, don't don't let him suffer. Don't let him suffer for an extended amount of time. My mom said that when, when I, by the time me and my family had left until November, he had lost a considerable amount of weight. And, you know, obviously it was getting worse and worse and worse. But he's at peace now. <laughs> he knew Jesus Christ. He received Christ as a Savior. And, and, and it was amazing to me because I, if, those of you that have iPhones, this is a little hack to see if people are actually reading what you send them. I send out all kind of verses and exhortations five days a week. It's just, uh, that's just something the Lord has laid on my heart. There was an older gentleman years ago that did it for me, and that's just something I picked up and doing it for years. Anybody I feel led to, I just add them to a thread. And so when I was out there, I prayed over my cousin and, and, and you know, told him, hey, man, I'm going to start because he couldn't go to church anymore because of his physical condition. He couldn't go to the physical building. So I, I said, you know, I'll send you these, these verses every day, five days a week, whatever, yada, yada. And uh, lo and behold, ever since I sent them to him, I would always see it says red. At the bottom, it said red. Sometimes it just says delivered. I look at my threads and it says delivered. That means they didn't look, they didn't look at it. But it says red. It says red. Oh, they could have it turned off. Okay. 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 Well, hopefully, hopefully everybody's reading it. But he didn't have it turned off. And I just thought that was super cool because it's like he asked for this and he was getting something out of the word every day you know and i can only imagine that even though physically it was probably excruciating and i can only imagine the horrible stuff he his body physically was dealing with as far as when you die of sta stage four cancer you go through that process but but i gotta believe that that his soul his spirit was rejoicing and that he was looking to a hope further than this and knowing that this isn't the end for him and so I just share that again because we, we learned about this last week. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the day that you die is going to be better than the day that you were born. We were also reminded that it is far better to live with the sober reality of death. What's up, brother? I'm not putting him on blast. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Eric. Coming into the house. You know what I mean? Hey, better than staying home. I ain't mad at him. The Lord ain't mad at you either. But we were reminded that it's, it's far better to live with a sober reality of death than to live constantly avoiding it with the luxuries of this world and, and with this mentality of, of, of just I'm, I'm, I'm being amused by festivities. 
It's far better to, to have a sober reality and a sober reminder. Not to live morbidly, but, but, to, but to have balance. It, it, it is good to enjoy uh, festivities too. But you see, we can't be either or. You don't want to be on one end where it's like, okay, now everything is dark and morbid. And, and it's like, why are there no lights on in here? Why are you always talking about death, but you're not talking about it in a good way? And you don't want to be the other person that's like, bro, you just don't get it. And you just think it's a life is a party. So, so we need to have a balance here, church. And I believe the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us this balance and helps us to navigate through life and able to enjoy the good times while at the same time knowing that this is not the end all. And that one day, man, my clock's going to run out. And am I ready to meet my maker? Am I prepared to go before the true and living God and give an account and assess and he, as an assessment of my life before him? This is what leads us to part two of this series. Once again, this title uh, this message is entitled The Difference Between Wisdom and Folly. We have several main points, as always, and the first one is this. Better to be rebuked by the words of a wise person than to be praised by a fool. We kind of touched on this last week, but I'm, uh, it's the same vein, kind of a different spin, and, and you'll get it. You see, God is perfect. Elohim is perfect. He is unlimited and unmatched in his wisdom. We can all say amen to that, right? We all believe that beyond what we can even conceive. My, my, my finite mind can't really even comprehend how great and majestical he truly is. You see, but in his infinite wisdom, he understands that in order for us human beings to truly learn, in order for us, for us to really learn something, we must be corrected. Amen. Prideful people hate that. Don't be the prideful person that thinks I got it right. You got it right the first time. I always got it right. No, you don't, bro. Have you met people like that? Have you been that person where I don't need no help? I got it right. I mean, <laughs> that's like the that's like the person that's like, man, they got the tricycle set for their kid and they're like, I don't ever read instructions. <laughs> uh, bro, I don't need you seem I'm a man's man. They just give me the tools, I'm gonna get to it. <laughs> It's like the instructions are there. You, you don't want to be that person, man. That, that's like this book. This book is instructions for your life. And the same person that throws away those instructions for that tricycle is the same person that throws away this book and says, I got this. No, you don't got this. <laughs> you need help. I need help. You see, it may seem elementary, but I dare say it's not. True learning comes through the avenue of correction. Just think about it. In every area of life, from a child learning how to ride a bike without training wheels, to a pilot learning how to fly a Boeing 747, we as human beings learn by being corrected. Aren't you grateful for that correction? You don't want to be in that 747 with somebody who hasn't been corrected. They're going to fly you into death. <laughs> They're not going to know how to navigate when they got to go through the storm. But if they've been trained correctly in simulation, they've been corrected and they know what to do. They will know what not to do. You see, the, the definition of rebuke is this to reprimand, strongly warn and restrain. Though being rebuked is painful, when it is needed, it is necessary. You see, the problem is, church, sometimes we simply just don't have the guts to correct someone. We're too scared. We're too afraid. We're too afraid of what they are going to say about us. We're too afraid about what we're, how they're going to view us. And that, that's, that's, that goes back to we're being selfish. Because think about Adam and Eve. This is not even in my notes, but just think of Adam and Eve. Okay? Before sin entered the world, they were God conscious. They didn't care that they were naked. It wasn't a thing. They didn't have to have Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton on. They didn't have to have Levi Stratus. They didn't have to have, you know, Banana Republic. They didn't have none of that, man. They didn't even need fig leaves. They're like, I'm good because I'm focused on the Lord. I'm God conscious. As soon as Eve fell into that lie from Satan, what happened? She and Adam became self-conscious. 
And ever since then, human beings have been fighting self-consciousness the whole time. We've been fighting it. People won't come out the house because they're like, dude, my hair don't look right. I mean, I struggle with it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I got to taper this hair. I got to get my, you know what I mean? My wife's like, why are you spend so many hours? Why you get up so early on Sundays? I said, because that's the day I cut my hair. And I got to get up early enough so I can make sure I have a buffer of enough time. So if I mess up, I can get it done. And then everybody else can get in the bathroom. I'm up super early. Don't get me wrong. I still get on my knees and pray and I'm before the Lord and all that. And I'm listening to messages while I'm doing my thing. But it's the same thing. I'm not, I'm not acting like I'm exempt from this. What I'm saying is, as human beings, we struggle with this whole self-conscious thing going on. But we need to get God conscious. We need to be aware of what's going on with him. Because that will alleviate us from all this extra baggage and stuff that we carry on into our lives. You see, the strong warning, restraint, and correction is vital for any believer that's in a compromising position. If you're compromising, if it's something serious or a little leaven leavens a whole lump, even if it's not, doesn't seem like it's something severe, but you're dabbling in stuff where you could be compromising your integrity, you need a strong warning. You need to be rebuked. It will be of great benefit to the individual who is willing to take heed to the rebuke who wants to change. But we got to be willing to change. You see, it's been said that integrity is what you do when no one's looking. And if we're not willing to have high integrity when no one's looking, we're probably not going to be willing to receive a rebuke when it comes upon us when we need to be corrected. But Proverbs chapter 13 verse 18 tells us clearly, poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction. But whoever heeds reproof is honored. Honored. You see how God's ways are not our ways? He tells us if you shun it, poverty is coming your way and disgrace will be upon your head. But if you heed the reproof and the correction that is coming your way, you're actually going to be honored. That's a beautiful thing. You see, the rebuke of a wise, godly person is far greater than the praise of a fool. When we are complimented by foolish people, these foolish people usually are not genuine. They compliment us because they have some kind of ulterior motive. They want something. They're not, it's not in your best interest. They're buttering you up so they can get something out of you. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 5 tells us, A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. <laughs> That's a clear warning. So you got to ask yourself, why are you complimenting me, man? <laughs> That's why the best thing to do is you receive a compliment. You just, you just, you just say, praise God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Give it back to him. Do not receive it for yourself like that. You just be like, man, it's all the Lord. You know? I, I met a gentleman. Uh, my, my daughter had a Christmas play on Friday, and I went to work late. And I was super cool, man. I had a great time, man. The kids are having a blast. At, you know, it's, it's Christian Montessori preschool, man. So they're being taught the truth. And all these kids did great. And, uh, you know, um, Teacher Harp usually asked me to, to pray over the, you know, procession or whatever. And she asked. And so whatever. That was cool. I did it. And then uh, later on, I met I met a gentleman and a super cool guy. He's Christian. I think he goes to church out in Sunnyvale. He's from the Caribbean. And uh, we were talking and and, you know, it, it was genuine for sure. But he was just like, you know, he's just kind of pouring on. And, and I believe it was of the Lord. But it's like every time I'm in that situation, I'm like, man, it's all the Lord. <laughs> it's all Jesus. Praise God. It ain't me. It's not me. I said, you and I share the same Holy Spirit. It ain't nothing fake. That's why you get it. That's why you understand it. But, you know, I'm not I'm not like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he was like, oh, man, that prayer was so, man, man you, you blessed me, man. You blessed. I said, no, nah, the Lord blessed you. <laughs> the Lord blessed you, brother. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It's just like when I talk about love. Don't, 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 don't say you love stuff. Don't say you love things. Love is reserved for God and for people. Now, you can say you like things a whole lot. You can say, I like the 49. Don't say you love the night. Don't say you love the Raiders. Please don't. <laughs> Do not say you love the Raiders. I don't say, I love them Raiders. What is wrong with you, man? You got it wrong, really wrong. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're, not, we're, we're, not, we're not supposed to be loving stuff. 
The Bible says, man, you love the things of the world. The love of the Father is not in you. Ooh, that hurts. Ooh, that's piercing. That's a word for somebody today. Check your mouth before you start saying what you love. <laughs> All right, the second main point is this. Patience. Patience. And, and, and don't we know we're all still working through getting more patience. But patience is always better than pride. The Bible tells us that it is better to be patient than proud. Yet our tendency is to be proud and not patient. <laughs> Why is this? <laughs> we, we tend to think more highly of ourselves than we should. And we tend to want things to happen immediately. Or the other side of the spectrum is we, we, we tend to think a lot less of ourselves. Like, oh, woe is me. I, I can't do anything. I have no talent. I'm not good. I'm, I'm being humble. No, that's a false humility. <laughs> I, 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 I can't do it. <laughs> or, 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 we, or, or we tend to never get around to doing anything that we say we're going to do. That's the other end of the spectrum. It's either we, we're, 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 we want it to happen right now. Or we say, oh, 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 I'm going to do it, brother. I'm going to do it. I'll be there. Bro, you ain't never showed up. I'm putting people on blast. <laughs> you ain't never showed up. Stop telling me you're going to come to the church house. Find a church house in your area then, man. <laughs> Why you said, don't let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Don't even say nothing. Don't let little old me make you feel obligated to say something. What? I'm just a man. I never introduced myself as the pastor. <laughs> people start getting wonky. It's like, bro, I'm just like you, man. If it ain't in you, it ain't in you. But, but we need to be serious about these things. You see, this patience is a vital characteristic of the Holy Spirit. And one that a child of God cannot afford to not grow in. We have to grow in patience, church. If you're one of those people, like, what are you grumbling about, man? You definitely need patience. And if you up in here thinking you're patient, you definitely need patience. <laughs> I mean, I'm keeping it real. The person that's like, I don't need a, come on now, yes, you do. <laughs> the person that's like, bro, you preach way too long. Homie, you need some patience, man, because we have been here for barely, what, two hours? Come on, man. Come on. Well, don't go to the south where, where they're going to have church. Then they're going to go downstairs and have lunch. Then they're going to come back upstairs. Napoleon Kaufman, the church he pastors at, man, they worship for an hour at the well in Livermore. They worship for an hour straight in song and praise before they even get into the message, man. <laughs> Some people are like, I can't go to that church. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, we need patience. Can't put the Holy Spirit in a box. Not even just in preaching and teaching, but in our lives. Thinking that all these things are going to happen. Well, I've been praying for this person for five years. So? If it's not the Lord's will for them to be saved, yeah, what are you supposed to do? Give up? No, keep praying. Keep living out your life in the authority of Christ Jesus and let him bring the increase. But you see, we get caught up in our own minds thinking, in our, in our own expectations. We have to uh, erode our expectations and not let our expectations supersede God's truth. Patience is mentioned at least 70 times in the Bible. This is for good reason. Gentle tolerance comes to most people's minds at the mention of the word patience. That's what they think about. But they're thinking of passively waiting, like a prisoner with a life sentence waiting to be set free. But the Bible has other things to say about what patience is. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which Cling so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Running the race, staying connected to Jesus Christ is the action we are supposed to produce. While endurance or patience is how we deal with whatever difficulties come with the action. So as we're running the race of life, right? There's all kind of things that are going to come our way. I, I, I love what we went to uh, Gene Scott's yesterday morning and, and you know, we uh, we prayed for Gene and Fred and and, and Daniel and, and Sal with me. And I love what Sal was uh, shared about, you know, um, 
the farmer planting the seed, I was talking about how, you know, it's, it's super difficult to plant a seed because you got to till the ground and you got to break through all kind of stuff. And, you know, blood, sweat and tears go into just planting the seed. But he brought up also the farmer doesn't necessarily know that pestilence is going to come. That's not part of what his, he's thinking. He's just trying to till the ground and get the seed in there. But there's all kind of other obstacles that come while he's planting the seed. And that's the same thing that's going on in this verse while he's talking about running the race. You run the race. It's not like you run the race and you're not getting hit. You're getting hit. Satan's trying to knock you off course every day. You got demons trying to come this and that and all the stuff that goes on. But you got to endure. That's the kind of patience the Bible's talking about. Not this just, oh, I'm just going to sit here and wait and look cute until it all happens. No, bro, you better press in. You better get locked in and get engaged in your walk with the Lord. Because that's the only way you're going to survive. Why do you see cats falling out? Why you ain't running hard with the Lord no more? Bro, because you ain't pressing in. You thinking it's just a cakewalk. It ain't a cakewalk. It ain't a dole. Yeah, I raised my hand. I got saved 20 years ago and now I'm just living. No. You should be progressing. Growing stronger. Growing bigger in the Lord. Just, just having more anointing. More favor. Do you understand, church? That you are responsible for the level, level of anointing that is placed upon your life. Based on how you respond to Christ alone. <laughs> Do you think it's just him? It's not just him, church. I'm not saying we're saved by works. Don't, uh, every time I say something like that, I, don't, I just don't ever want to ever get it misconstrued. I don't ever want someone to take my words out of context. What I'm saying is... We truly are responsible for the level of anointing that is poured upon our lives. If you press in hard to God, he's going to press back harder to you. And he's going to open up the floodgates of heaven more. If you're giving him the crumbs of your time, don't question why the anointing is not even barely there. As simple as that. It's as simple as that. So we, 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 again, we want him to be our portion so we, can, so we can eat and drink richly of the living bread and of the living water that is Christ so that we can be flowing and living, abounding in his goodness and his greatness. But this is something that we have to learn through patience, through pressing in hard, through striving after Christ. Patience is a virtue that is developed by God's power. And again, we basically get developed through the trials that we go through every day. How many of y'all are going through trials today? Everybody's hands should be going up because everybody's going through some kind of trial. <laughs> Everybody. I don't care if all your ducks are in a row. You're still battling spiritual warfare. You are. Because there are being fire, there are fiery arrows that are being shot at you. I can guarantee you right now, somebody in this room is fighting some demonic thought that's trying to come through their mind right now. Because I'd be up in this pulpit and they'd be trying to hit me. <laughs> I got to keep it 100 with y'all. Because this is the reality. This ain't no cute Christianity, man. This is the raw, real deal. We're dealing with real deal stuff that everyday people here down on earth go through every single day. And it goes back to that whole thing of the sober reality of death or being fascinated with the illusion of parties and all that let's keep it real so we can really grow amen and really be free and really have all this bondage broken off of us so we can live in victory and in freedom amen. this is why patience is so much better than pride you see pride is destructive because it takes life into its own hands pride assumes that we don't need god as our counselor, again, the origins of pride are found in Satan. This is why pride is so deathly destructive, because it's of Satan. It's of the father of lies. It's not in God. It's in the enemy, the adversary of God. He is the one that's built up in pride. So anytime you and I sense pride bubbling up within us, we got to humble ourselves. <laughs> You gotta say, Lord, forgive me. I mean, there's times at work where I'm like, I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, man, I'm getting frustrated. <laughs> you know me, I'm OCD. Wrong profession to go in. Working with autistic people, I'm OCD. I'm like, bro, aren't you spitting on me, man? <laughs> that Lord's like, man, humble yourself, man. This dude, he can't help it, you know? And, but I'm just saying, church, this is real. We, whenever that, that pride wants to bubble up in us, we just say, no, Lord, I don't want that. I'm going to humble myself. 
before God and before men. All right, the third main point is this. Wisdom preserves the life of those who have it. I just love the book of Proverbs, right? For years, uh, the Lord has led me to, to do this. I'm sure many of you do it too, where, you know, the whole Proverbs, you know, I think Caleb talks about all the time. You know, we've, been, we've known about it for years. There's 30 chapters in, in the book and you go, one day I'm reading Proverbs chapter one. <laughs> If it's day 17, I'm reading Proverbs 17. I mean, that's just an elementary baseline way to stay in the word of God daily. And and it's so good. It's so rich because there's so much wisdom in the book of Proverbs. But Proverbs chapter one through nine specifically talk and speak from this perspective of wisdom. It reveals that wisdom is more than knowing what to do. It's also doing it because of a godly fear of the Lord. You see, it's not enough to know what to do. Many people know what to do. But only a handful of people actually do it. It's like you can't stand those people that are always yammering their mouth, talking, running their bumping their gums about what what you should do. But it's like, bro, you ain't look at you ain't even doing it, bro. <laughs> can you can you be the person that actually, that's actually living it out to talk into my life? Because that that's counterproductive to be telling someone what they should do, but you're not doing it yourself. Proverbs chapter four, verse six tells us, do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. I mean, why would you not want to embrace wisdom? Why would you not want to have a healthy fear of God so that you could be protected? Why would you not love God in this way? It says that, man, he's going to watch over you. We need wisdom, church, to discern right from wrong. We need it. To know what to say and what not to say. We need it to distinguish between good and evil. We need it to know who speaks truth into our lives and who speaks lies. Amen? Amen. All right, let's go ahead and break down these verses. So we're going to look at 5 through 9 right now. I'll read it again. And it says, It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot... So is the laughter of the fools. This is also vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry for anger anger is lodged in the heart of fools. Okay, let's look at this first statement. It says, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the songs of fools. The person who finds wisdom through their relationship with Jesus Christ, which is all of us, we're the church, right? Knows that though it's painful, adversity and suffering produce better results than ease and comfort. Just look at your life. Think about, think about the times when you've really grown spiritually. It's probably been when you've gone through some form of suffering, When things are all good, how are you growing? (laughs) How are you being challenged when everything is all gravy? But when you're in lean seasons, when you're in tough times, that's when you grow as a Christian. Or you grow all the more. You see, the song of a fool is but for a moment and it produces absolutely no substance at all. It's just like donuts. (laughs) I I like donuts. It's kind of funny. We serve donuts. (laughs) They're not, they're, not meant to, they're not meant to sustain you throughout the day or throughout the morning. It's just a little sweet treat. But imagine if you just spent your life eating donuts. <laughs> I, want, I want something hearty. <laughs> I want something that's going to fulfill me, that's going to stick to my belly. <laughs> I don't want donuts for my day's worth of eating. Empty and hollow. That, that's what the song of a fool is. But it is through correction that we learn the most what is right and what is wrong. We're able to discern truth from error. We know that Yahweh is sovereign and he's fully capable of overriding any decision we make. He can do it in a blink of an eye, right? In his unfathomable love and wisdom, he is in perfect, complete fellowship with himself. The Godhead. I can't explain it more than it's the person of the Holy Spirit. It's God the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the person of the Holy Spirit, right? The Trinity. I I can't explain it more than that. But he says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, I'm not going to read those verses, just going to read that statement. Let us make man in our own image, right? Let us make man in our own image. 
And we know this to be true because in Hebrew, when you see I am, I am, whenever it's added to the end of a word, that means the term becomes plural, not singular, but more than one. Example, seraphim, cherubim. These terms refer to more than one of these kind of angels. The title Elohim, one of the titles of God, Elohim is plural. Not that there is more than one God. We know there's only one true and living God, but rather within the Godhead lives us, lives a unity, lives a fellowship, perfect fellowship. God the Father, once again, Jesus Christ the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit. I share all this to say the same God who is in need of absolutely nothing, who's in perfect fellowship and harmony within himself, still somehow desires fellowship with us. And he actually gets delight and is blessed by our relationship with him. Isn't that amazing? He is in need of nothing, but he longs. To have us as the object of his affection. In order to love, you have to have somebody to love. Again, that's, that's the mind-blowing thing of the Godhead. He's in perfect love with himself. In not a vain way at all. In a perfect unity love. But yet, even despite that, he still desires to also project his love upon us. His creation. His crown jewel of creation, rather. And say, I love you. I want to bring you into perfect fellowship with myself. Will you receive me so that I and you can be together, whole? This is why we must choose to love him back. But the reality is this, church. No one can do it for you. This is what I'm teaching my kids right now. Like, I can't love Jesus for them. Like, you have to decide. You know, we're going through a thing right now where my kids, they... they, pray kind of but they're like daddy pray because i kind of have done it for such a long time where i pray for the, the meal i pray for the message i pray before bed and i'm like i'm praying because i'm i'm giving you guys a model of what you need to do i said but i got my own relationship with christ i said your mother has her own relationship i said you can't live through me you can't live through your mother you have to have your own personal relationship with god you cannot live through me You have to love God for yourself, church. You can't live through me. You can't live through your neighbor. You can't live through your sister, your brother, your grandpappy. You have to choose Christ for yourself and say, I, blank, fill in the blank, love you, Lord. I surrender myself to you, Lord God. That is a genuine relationship. And in every genuine relationship, this is the point I'm trying to make, church, mistakes are made. (laughs) When we do things that are not pleasing to Father God, we are going against his word. He won't ever disown us, but he does correct us and sometimes even rebuke us because we're in fellowship with him. Just like a parent will rebuke a child. You guys know parents, grandparents, great grandparents. You know what it is. I know Mark, he's a three year old (laughs) to tell you, (laughs) hey. Better that they learn now than have to hear it at 30 and it'd be more painful. You see, remember when Jesus rebuked the apostle Peter? No one would ever say that God didn't love Peter. Jesus loved Peter. But in that moment, he needed to be corrected. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 and 23 tells us, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, speaking of Christ, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Man, could you imagine Christ saying that to you? He said, get behind me, Satan. Bro, you're allowing this unclean spirit of this world to speak through you right now. (laughs) Your mind's not set on the things of heaven. You're thinking in the flesh because you, you, you don't want me to suffer. But you don't realize the plan that me and my father and the Holy Spirit have had before time's beginning to, to help you and to help all of humanity. You see, Peter thought he was protecting Jesus by saying he would not let him, allow him to go to the cross. But Peter, even with good, sincere intentions, was sincerely wrong and there's many people like that in 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 the day and age we live they're super sincere about their beliefs oh yeah yeah i believe this and that 
I'm going to be good with God. I'm good. I've done good deeds. I feed the poor. I haven't cheated on my wife. I, 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 I got an inheritance for my children. That don't get you to heaven, man. <laughs> They're sincere. Oh, I don't need the, I don't need to go to I don't need to go to a church. I got the Bible at home. I got a relationship with God. You've heard that before. I got my relationship with God. I, I don't need fellowship. I got fellowship with God. You're sincerely wrong, sir. You are sincerely wrong. But the rebuke from God was far better than the song and praise of a fool. Even though Jesus rebuked Peter, that was far better for Peter than for him to be praised by someone else. Maybe another apostle was thinking the same thing, but just Peter, you know, Peter, well, he was the one to open his mouth. I can think, I can see Judas. Judas like, yeah, 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 Peter, we ain't going to let you die. That's the praise of a fool because Jesus just rebuked Peter. And Judas, here he come. You know, you're yes, man. You know, I'm yes, man. You got to watch out for them yes, man, them yes, women that just want to come next to you and pump you up. Like, man, what you pumping me up for? It ain't making no sense. The application is this, church. When we willingly, see, this is the key, willingly, not begrudgingly, not, ugh, I snarl at you when you rebuke me. Ugh, I hate the fact that you rebuked me, but I receive it. No. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Especially you that have kids. I'm going through that too right now. I right, bro, why are you looking at me nasty, man? Wipe that look off your face. Because it ain't okay. Your heart ain't right. I don't care what you said. You said it all with your face. When we willingly receive the rebuke from a godly person... We benefit because we're set back on the correct path. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 17 tells us, Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof, excuse me, leads others astray. Ooh, do you see how bad that stings? (laughs) He said, if you don't receive the godly rebuke, Bro, you're actually leading other people astray. It's bad enough you off track. Now you over here leading all these other people down the wrong way too because you ain't right and you ain't trying to get right. So humility is so important in our walk with the Lord, church. None of us, including myself, is ever above humbling ourselves in in the smallest and biggest sense of the word. You don't know how many times I've had to apologize to my children. I mean, kids, none of these, neither of these kids are at double digits yet. And I've apologized to them a whole bunch. Apologized to my wife all the time. But you know what? That liberates me. That frees me. That gives me a peace that passes all understanding. I don't have guilt. I don't have shame hanging over my head. I can walk around and know that I'm good to go. I can be free because I don't have all this bondage. But when we're prideful, man, it just it just messes us up, church. Next statement, it says for the crackling of thorns under a pot. That's that's what the, the, the you know, the, the, the praise of a fool is like that. So is the laughter of fools. This is also vanity. Just as thorns are weak, useless and unprofitable and hurtful. These things are only fit for burning, just like the foolish or wicked men and women that choose not to repent. They're only good for burning. <laughs> that's not my statement. That's the word of God. That's hardcore. If you don't want to repent and you commit the only unpardonable sin, which is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is basically you've been told over and over your whole life, hey, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to receive you. Jesus gave his life for you. And he, 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 he rose from the dead so that you could be forgiven. And all your life you're saying, yeah, 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 yeah. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only unpardonable sin. If you commit suicide, there's probably people that committed suicide that are going to be in heaven. That's not the unpardonable sin. People that are homosexual, that got saved, that's not the unpardonable sin. People that murdered and killed, look, Moses killed, David killed, David committed murder and adultery, and he's in heaven. But if you commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that is not ever going to be forgiven. So if today you hear the Lord's voice, this ain't even in my notes. Don't harden your heart. Receive Christ into your heart as Savior and ruler of your life. Don't wait another day. Just as the noise and sound of thorns under a pot are very short, they make a blaze for a while and then they're over. You know, like the little twigs that you put in the fire. They only crackle for a quick minute and then they're done. You need a big log to burn hard. (laughs) 
But when you got them little small ones, this is the same thing as the laughter of a fool. It's loud and noisy, but it's only for a moment. Eventually, it, it will be you know, put out and, and they will again experience weeping and howling and gnashing of teeth that will last forever. That is so horrible. And I, I don't take any pleasure in saying that. But that is what the Bible says. That's what hell is going to be. Weeping and howling and gnashing of teeth. You know why they're gnashing their teeth? Because it's the same thing. They're gritting and cursing the name of God. They're there. They're as mad as they can be. Angry. Cursing God. It's not going to be a party in hell. They're going to hate it. And they're going to hate God. And there's never no peace. And there's never no joy. And it's continually on and on and on for eons and eons. And it never ends. Why would you risk it while you're here now? And you see the difference. You got life and death. Choose life. (laughs) I mean, I... I do understand now it's the Lord who draws all men unto himself. It's a shame if you're not being drawn to God. How sad is that? I think that's the saddest state of a human being when they're not being drawn to Almighty God. I mean, that's horrible. That means you, you, you're, you're not there. You're not there. God creates people for evil too. You know that. People say, how can it be? Yes, it is. Read your Bibles. Read your Bibles. He creates men for the day of evil. Count your blessings that you hear his voice now and that you're saved. I mean, this this, this, this is the most intense thing that you could ever deal with. You're dealing with human souls, the eternity of a human being. This is not anything to play games about. This is so more important than the Niners or what your 401k says or what you're going to buy for Christmas or where you live or what clothes you're going to wear tomorrow or if it's going to rain next week. This has to do with the eternal destination of people's souls. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the heart. That's the next statement we're looking at. Solomon understood that that suffering also has its limits because because suffering without the Lord stepping in, it it would destroy a wise man's reason. You know, the Bible in Revelation talks about it. If the days weren't shortened from all the suffering that's going to come upon the world, even the elect, even us, we would be annihilated. But Father God is going to put a stop to all of this before it gets really out of hand. That's crazy if you think about it. Look at how crazy things are right now. And this is a drop in the bucket to what's going to pop off off into the future. I'm telling you, church, like when, it, when they start cracking down on us here in the United States, you know it's getting close. <laughs> when they start saying you can't meet here, you're condemned. You can't speak about the, on the name of Jesus. I mean, they're already doing it subtly. We took the Ten Commandments out of the courthouses. We took prayer out of school. We took, we took Christ out of school. You can't speak on Jesus Christ in the universities. They think they're so esteemed and they're so intellectual. But the, the, but the God of all creation, they won't utter his name. But it's going to get a whole lot worse than that, church. But praise God that he's going to stop it all before it gets really, really gone. You know, the only reason why there's any form of peace in this world is because of you allowing yourself to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit. You know that, right? Once the Holy Spirit is taken out of here and and he completely moves his hand off of this world, it's going to be full on satanic. Everybody, everybody. That's why, church, we have to wake up. We have to lock in and go hard in our sphere of influence because you may be the only Christ that somebody around you is going to see. And you got to bring them the truth and you got to bring it in love. But you got to know the word and you got to know what you know, what you know, so you don't get beat down when they try to come back to you with some other nonsense. You know, you can't let a Jehovah's Witness run that game on you because you don't know the word. Then you over here like, I, I, I mean, shoot, I thought I knew. I, I, don't even, I don't even really know now. 
maybe there's only really 144,000 people that are going to go into heaven. They got it completely wrong. Let me talk about the Jews, man. Ain't there more than, and I'm not bashing, I just got to call it what it is. There's more than 144,000 people just in that religion alone. So you know that ain't right. Uh, millions of people that worship like that. You tell me all them people going to hell and only the little elect few? Come on, man. That ain't right. But that's why we got to know this word. So that when you're faced with opposition, you're not going to budge. You're not going to flicker. You're not going to be, you're, you're not going to be intimidated by what people say or what some kind of demonic spirit tries to convince you of. No, get behind me, Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's why we go back to the word. That's why we stand on the word of God, because it's his promises. It's what the word says that is true. Everything else is just some, you know, opinion or whatever. Somebody wants to jumble up to make it sound good, but it's not. It's watered down truth. We need the truth of the word of God alone. Amen. Amen. The idea of, uh, of limits is biblical. From the limits that God set forth from the waters and the land. Remember when he created everything, he said, water, you're only going to go this far <laughs> and then you're going to have land. To setting limits on how much Satan could torment Job. Remember that? Man, Satan's like, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to kill this dude. God's like, you can get at my boy, just don't kill him. Man, you done killed all his kids. You done gave him boils. Had his wife curse him. Man, went through it. But, but God said, there's a limit. You're not going to take his life. <laughs> and you're going to watch him shine. <laughs> you're going to watch me shine through him because he's, he's, he's not going to, he's not gonna, uh, you know, denounce me. He's going to keep his eyes fixed on the one true and living God. So we know that this idea of limits is biblical. Um, even when it comes to you and me, the Bible is clear. We will not be tempted more than we can actually handle. Have you ever been in a situation where you're, you feel so overwhelmed and you're like, oh, my gosh, the temptation is so hard. I just got to do it. And like God makes a way of escape. You don't have to go drink that cup. You don't have to go lay up with that person. You don't have to go take that smoothie. <laughs> you don't have to go eat that third cookie. Like, he's going to make a way of escape. Sometimes we just be like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed. I can't take it. Oh, my gosh. I can't it. Ah, I sinned. I felt good for like two seconds, and now I feel horrible. I feel like crap. <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> but 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 tells us, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. Make him bigger than your circumstance. Amen. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. That you may be able to what? Endure it. We need to hold on to that church. You see bribery. Moving on. Bribery is never a good thing. It corrupts the heart. Because a person who continues to commit the sin of bribery. Can become so desensitized. To manipulating situations or people. To get what they want. That they actually become a prisoner. Of their own unclean way of thinking. They can't get out of it. They can't get out I, I, I don't know why it came to my mind right now, but Leo, Leo DiCaprio in The Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> he got so wrapped up in the greed of trying to get more and more and more that it's like, bro, by the time you wanted to undo it, you couldn't undo it. You're a slave. Your hands are tied behind your back, and now you're, now you're, you're doing the will of Satan, and you can't even do it. What was his name, Daniel? Um, remember, uh, you know, Church of Satan uh, in San Francisco, he the founder? Right. And what did he say at the end of his life when he was on his deathbed? Oh God, what have I done? See, he wanted to undo it then. You worship in Lucifer. But then at his deathbed, it was too late. He had been so far gone in it. That he couldn't stop. That's why the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Don't allow yourself to dabble in sin and get close to sin and see how long you can go sinning and still being okay. Because you're never okay. I'm never okay when I'm sinning. You're never okay when you're sinning. Get right immediately. Because you don't want to be in that place where you can't, you can't, you can't undo it. You can't unbound yourself. You're literally bound to the addictions. You're bound to the lifestyle. And Satan, listen, he hates your guts. He don't want to give you up. Once he gets his clutches on you, he does not want to give you up. 
Now, if you're signed and sealed with the Holy Spirit, you know you cannot lose your salvation. But like I say all the time, he will try to render you useless and ineffective for the kingdom of God. You don't want that. You don't want to be a neutered Christian. <laughs> you don't. You don't. You want to be somebody that's, that's bold as a lion for Christ. All right, next we see. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Okay, just like we learned last week. The culmination of things is better than the beginning of them. You know, it, it's great to finish something. It's great to accomplish. Because you, you see all the work put in. And it's like, wow, this is, this is a good thing. The satisfaction that you get from completing a task or goal is far greater than when you start one. An example, I'm going to use it. It's corny, but I'll use it. <laughs> the 49ers started the season. It was good. But how much sweeter is it going to be when they hold up that Lombardi trophy <laughs> and they're Super Bowl champs? I told you it's corny. They better, not, they better not have a debacle if they play Philly. They better play them at home this year, hopefully, in the NFC Championship. Anyways, I digress. Our lives here are, are great, and they're such a blessing. But as we live out our lives on earth, we're going from glory to glory with the final destination in sight, eternity with the eternal God. That day will be far better than the day you and I were born. Next, we see the statement, the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Again, patience will always supersede pride in God's economy. Here is what the word of God says about the benefits of patience. Patience is bearing up under the adversity that you will face in life, anticipating God's timing, not your own. It's like, again, a weightlifter, you know, they bear up. And when you're doing a bench press, you got to bear up under those 45 plates or however many, you know, how much weight you have. And you got to bear up under it and you're lifting it. Ah, ah, ah. And it hurts and you're tearing your muscles and all that goes on and you're sweating and uh, it's crazy. But you're getting stronger physically and spiritually. When you're going through difficult times, you're bearing up under the pressure and the trials of life. Church, many times peace is not going to come when everything is tranquil around you. Peace is going to come in the form of Jesus Christ when you're in smack dab, the heart of hard situations. The more we run away from our problems, can someone turn the cold air on? I, don't, I have it on, but it's like, I'm, I don't know, maybe it's me. I'm having hot flashes at 45. I don't know what's going on, but it's hot up in here. But, but, but you know, the, the, we have to bear up under we can't run from our problems. Trust that God is walking you through your problems. And, and, and what, what happens? It's the refiner's fire, right? You're going to come through as gold. But you got to go through the heat. you got to go through the pain. you got to go through, for some of you, maybe it's loneliness. Man, I'm lonely. I don't got a lot of people around me. Or I'm not married. Or, or I don't have, you know, I want kids and I don't have any children. But God is with you. Look at what you do have. You have Christ. You have Christ. Go back to the word. Go back to the promises of God. Hold on to that. Do not be deceived by your emotions or Satan. It is definitely a challenge to cultivate patience, but it is essential to the Christian life. Patience is important because it proves our faith in God's timing. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 tells us, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Today, church, somebody needs to hear that. Do not give up in doing good. You may be right around the corner from reaping such a big harvest, but you're burnt out. I get it. But trust in him. He'll supernaturally give you the strength to carry on. He will. He said, if you don't give up, don't give up. Press in. Press in. Keep pressing in. Pride, again, is never a good thing. We all must learn to be led by the Holy Spirit and forsake our flesh that feels it is entitled to do whatever it wants. You see, pride alienates us from God. It separates us. When we're prideful, there's a wedge. The veil has already been torn. Why would you and I want to build back up another barrier between us and holy God? When we are prideful, we're building that layer back up. 
And he's not going to break it. You got to break it. I got to break it. We break it by repentance. We break it by humility. Whether consciously or not, the proud are estranged from God. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 5 tells us, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. I take no pleasure in saying that, but he says it's an abomination. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It's clear warnings that we need to steer clear of pride, church. We need to be those that are humble in heart and in spirit. Amen. All right, last two verses. 10 and 12, it says, Say not, why were the former days better than these? For this is not wisdom from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is, wisdom is good with an inheritance and an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. <laughs> it's funny, the protection of money. Makes me think of a bank. Do not say... Why were the former days better than these? You see, I, I, I love our, our, our Heavenly Father for this. He's all about new works. He's a God of new works. He, he's a God of freshness. Think about this. Because Yahweh is infinite, He's eternal, never having a beginning or ending. He is constantly fresh. He's constantly new. He's always new because he doesn't age. He's, he lives outside of space and time. He lives outside of, uh, of this, this, this dilemma we're in, in a, a three-dimensional world. He's outside of it completely. There's always a freshness about him and all that he does. Remember, it's only because sin entered the world that plant life, animal life, ocean life, and human life died physically. <laughs> it's only because of sin. Remember what Jesus taught his disciples? Luke chapter 5, verse 7, 37 through 38. And no one puts new wineskins into old wine, or new wine into old wineskins. If he does, then the new wine will burst the skins, and it'll be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But the new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. You see, this parable was all about the former self dying, and the new man being created afresh and new in Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 30, chapter 36, verse 26, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Again, this can only happen to us, church, if we submit to God and allow him alone to regenerate us from the inside out. Amen. When this happens, we won't hold on to this perspective of weren't the old days so good? People talk about the good old days. I'm talking about today, man. I mean, don't forget where you come from, because that again will keep you humble. Humble beginnings. Don't forget what you've ever been through, but you should never long for the, they weren't good old days. Getting drunk, waking up, not knowing who you're next to, not knowing where you're at with, without this and without that, all battered and bruised, going to jail, losing this and losing that, wrecking cars, you know, hanging out with people where it's like they don't care about you. That's not the good old days, man. It's not. The application is this. We were created to be continually refreshed in Jesus Christ. This is why he tells us in John chapter 7, verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Father God, through his son, Jesus Christ, desires that you and I be refreshed moment by moment, day after day in him. The one who is endless and eternal. That way, rivers of supernatural water, supernatural power, supernatural energy, supernatural insight, supernatural discernment, supernatural love and joy and peace will continually flow from him to us. People ask you, why you ain't tired? Because I serve God, man, and he ignites me. I ain't drank coffee in over a year. I ain't drank an energy drink in over three years. I'm hyped up like this, not because this is a joke or a game, because the Lord's got me in this position. It's him. But when you submit your life before him, this is what he does. This is living with an eternal perspective that the best is yet to come. Your last day on this earth should be your best. It really should. 
This is far different from Lot's wife. Remember her? Remember the angel told her. I told all of them, flee, get out of here. Fire from heaven is raining down on these places. Do not look back. But something she obviously was holding on to made her glance back at Sodom and Gomorrah as those cities were burning. When she did that, she turned into a pillar of salt. Longing for the good old days. That is not wise, but foolish. I'll end with this as Isaiah and Michelle can come up whenever they're ready. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and profitable to those who see the sun. Wealth is to be enjoyed. Enjoy having good things. The Bible would never tell you to be poor. Abraham was rich. Jacob was rich. Job was rich. Okay. Wealth is to be enjoyed and wealth coupled with wisdom leads to eternal purpose, not just for living for the here and now. So it needs to be coupled with the godly perspective. When we apply wealth and wisdom to living with purpose, we find how to live with joy. Wisdom preserves the life of those who have it. Godly wisdom will keep us and sustain us through all the days of our lives. There is honestly no better way to live than to live a life that is filled with the wisdom of God as he gives in whatever measure he gives to you. The more you seek him, the more you're going to find more. (laughs) So if you want more wisdom, seek him more. But we must purpose that this is what we want. We have to decide this is what I want in my life, Lord. And you got to lock in like an infrared beam. I'm locking in to what Christ has for me. And you and I have to follow hard after Jesus. Not no mamsy, pamsy Christianity, man. I'm talking about this is my life. This is what I live for. This ain't no hobby. This ain't no game. This ain't no show. This is what this is how I sustain my everyday being. You see, because church, zeal and emotion are simply not enough. Zeal and emotion will run out. And what you really have at the end of life is what's really in you. So if he's really in you, it don't matter if you feel like it or not. You serve Christ out of obedience, not out of emotion. We must strive to follow hard after Christ. I'll end with Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, because this talks about everything we need in wisdom. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your ear to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, If you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth and come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Yahweh, we thank you once again, just for all that you give us. You have purpose for our lives. You have meaning that you've given to each and every one of us. You've called each and every one of us by name personally. And you have said, my son, my daughter, be reconciled to me. Father, I thank you for that gift of salvation that's found in your son, Jesus Christ alone. Lord, may we never forget the sacrifice it costs your son to give his life so that we could be redeemed. May we never treat it as common of what you've done for us. May we be those who anticipate your coming back and that we would just go hard after you. Help us to forsake our flesh. Help us to forsake all these other things that are vying for our attention. And may we focus in on you, the author and finisher of our faith. Father God, we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Uh, This morning I I wanted to pray for communion as uh, it just was brought to my attention. The importance of communion. It is so important. Christ instituted this for us. He said for us to do this when we meet. There's nothing magical about it. 
but it's 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 a it's a way of memorializing Christ in our own minds, in our own hearts. It's not something we just do loosely and then we're done with it. Like Memorial Weekend, we're supposed to memorialize those who have gone before us and have fought for the freedoms of this country so that we can enjoy the liberties that we have. But what does it turn into many times? We don't think about the people that died unless we have people in our family that gave their lives for this for this country. It turns into a barbecue or it, it turns into a sale somewhere at some store or a day off to rest a little bit more. But we truly don't memorialize it. But when we go to a memorial, when we know someone who's died, someone gets up and people speak about what the person has done. And they may have a slideshow that shows about what this man or woman accomplished in their life. And there's pictures all over the room. And you go and you dress up and you're solemn. You're not loud and boastful because it's a memorial service. You're trying to honor the memory of the person that's left this earth. So when you and I go back to that table, this is how we should go. It's not a quick thing. It's something that we search our hearts and we think about what Christ did. His body was broken and whipped in anguish. His beard was pulled out for you and I. His blood was shed so that we could be redeemed. And when we go to that table, we ask the Lord to search our innermost hearts and whatever sin is inside of us, we ask him to get it right with him before we go back. Because if we don't, the Bible says we bring judgment upon ourselves. Father, I thank you that you are so merciful and you are so gracious to us in how you deal Father, as we go into this time of communion, may it be heavy on our hearts that we truly examine what you've done for us and where we are at with you. And if there be any besetting sin in us that's causing grief to your heart, may we get right with you before we take the elements. You want us to. You encourage us to. But there is a stipulation. We must be right before you before we partake. So I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, that before they partake, myself included, that we would examine our hearts and know for a fact that we're right before you and that we would be able to take freely and enjoy the goodness of you leaving us these elements to remember you. Father, we pray this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.